I think it's true to say, looking back on the on the Rhodesian war years, that the particularly as the war escalated, everybody in the country was to some degree exposed to some risk. Uh, that's just the nature of, 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 of an insurgency war where the enemy can appear and attack it anywhere, anytime. And that affected people living in urban and rural environments. But for people going about the normal, their normal course of business and their normal duties, few were as exposed to danger as consistently as the men and women of the Rhodesian Department of National Parks and Wildlife, who by their very nature were posted to the remotest parts of the country where they were extremely vulnerable. And despite this, it is quite astonishing what they managed to achieve because they saw right through that war, they guarded their domains and faced danger on an almost daily basis. And this, as a result, at the end of the war, the country's wildlife estate was actually in pristine condition. The wildlife had been diligently protected. The rhino, the black rhino population of the Zambezi Valley was flourishing, and the new government took over a, a priceless possession, really, uh, thanks to the, the, the endeavors of these um, extraordinary men and women. And uh, so it's a real pleasure to have Steve Edwards here uh, to chat to us today. Steve was in national parks throughout the war. He ended up as a Seleuscout uh, in the territorials, the Seleuscouts, but uh, he knows an awful lot about what did happen. And um, I know he's going to give us some, some great insight into some very interesting years and events. So uh, welcome, Steve. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Hannes. Thanks for, for including me. I'm actually quite honored that uh, you've invited me to be able to talk about the guys that really did fight on the front there. Um, yeah, National Park certainly were involved. As you quite correctly said, a lot of the national parks are out on the extremities around the edges of the country. And uh, the parks and my life estate extended to, I do believe, 14 or 15 percent of the land coverage of Zimbabwe or Rhodesia. Yeah. Steve, uh, just a little bit about your background and how you ended up in national parks. I just, um, when I was at school, uh, we were chosen to go on what was then called the Rhodesian Schools Exploration Society. <laughs> and uh, I went in as a, a bird lover. I've always been keen on birds, feathered ones. and. Um, and the guy in charge of our particular group was a guy called Carl Vernon, and he became my hero. And um, I always wanted to join National Parks. I can thank my parents for sort of instilling the wildlife bit in me because as kids, the school holidays, we would always go to Wanky National Park and uh, camp there. And so I always had it in my blood. There was nothing else I wanted to do. And uh, I joined National Parks in 72. I do believe I'm the youngest guy that joined National Parks ever. And uh, that was it. I'd set my whole How old you? life. And, huh, do I dare say it? I was 16. <laughs> yeah, I was a little whippersnapper. <laughs> and you, uh, I didn't go to, I did 10, actually. Did you? 10, yeah. Um, because National Parks said, when I'd, I'd been writing to them incessantly that I wanted to join, and they kept saying, you're too young. Do you even have a driver's license, you know? <laughs> <laughs> have you done your army and army training and so on? So uh, they wanted me to do my national service first, get a driver's license, and they said, you must have O-levels. So I had set my mind at school. That's what I was going to do. 
Anyway, I, I, I managed to clap that. And I went back to do M level and they wrote to me and invited me for an interview. So M level went out the window. I left school and I went for an interview. And uh, well, the rest is history. <laughs> Steve, in your first posting? Believe it or not, I got one of the creme de la cremes. I was posted at Victoria Falls. <laughs> and uh, much to the jealousy of many of my comrades, it was a fantastic station. What I liked about Vic Falls was that you had the best of both worlds. We had uh, the casino and the hotels and the bars, and I think there must have been at least 10 bars. But one minute's drive in the other direction, we were in a fantastic national park, Zambezi National Park, with the big five in it. Awesome. Right up my street. Steve, were you there when they made the movie with Ursula Andrews? Unfortunately, not with Ursula. Um, that was uh, Derek Langman, I think it was. Okay. And he had a lot of fun there with her, I can assure you. Um, I was involved in a movie with that Richard Chamberlain fellow, and I've forgotten the lady's name now. Britt uh, Eklund. No, no, not Britt. Uh, um, Sharon Stone. Uh, Stone. Sharon Stone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that was also quite exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, um, that's all a lot more fun to talk about, but we had to talk <laughs> about, we're talking about war. So let's yeah, go back sure. to, um, I think what it would present really a watershed moment in the country's history, and certainly in the history of the war, was David Scammell uh, cutting tracks. I think it was in Chawori, and yeah. it, was, it was that that triggered the biggest then the biggest operation of the of the war. Can you just talk us through what you know about those events? Yeah. Um, I, I wasn't involved in that in any way, but Dave Scammell was one of my seniors. And at the time, I think he was stationed in Chiwori and he was on one of his uh, foot patrols and came across um, these boot patterns. And I don't know if you recall, in the early days, the, the insurgents, terrorists, all wore these, what we called figure of eight mm -hmm. boots. And they became quite synonymous with a lot of the crossings. Optique, uh, Cauldron, Op Griffin, they all seemed to be issued those boots. Um, so he picked it up and I remember he had sketched it and, and had said, this is what I've seen. And it was a, a, quite a swathe. So it was a lot of people. and. Uh, he had reported it, and as you say, that, that ended up being one of the biggest incursions in the early days, and continuous punch-ups all the way along. I think they basically went up the Chawori River and up into the escarpment, and all the way along, the, the RLI guys uh, were called in. It was the early days, and um, yeah, fleeting contacts all the way up through the escarpment. Um, yeah, that was... That was really the beginning. Uh, I think seventy or eighty insurgents were killed in that in that um, series of operations. Um, but then, what was just where was your sort of first introduction to the war? Um, how did it come calling on your doorstep? Um, I was stationed in various stations um, on the border areas. Um, Mana Pools being one of them. And we sort of took on a war footing, although our job was to look mm -hmm. after wildlife. That was our mandate. We were always right in the front on, on the edge of the borders. And of course, the guys were crossing the Zambezi. And so our, our day would kick off with um, clearance patrols. We would be going to look for landmines. And uh, and uh, we can get onto that later. But uh, I, in fact, on one of those clearance patrols, we found um, a cap, um, East German rice flick camo, myself and John Stevens on one of our clearance patrols. And it was then that we realized that they, they had been wrecking us, in fact. But Victoria Falls, um, my first station, uh, the SAP was stationed there, um, South African police. And... Uh, they weren't really military trained and 
quite a few of them were taken out uh, when they were swimming in the Zambezi, for example. Um, and there was a couple of landmines in the park, in the Zambezi National Park. I remember for years and years, when I went back as warden about 13 years later, there was still the effect of the crater from one of the landmines that had uh, killed some South African police that were stationed there. Steve, let's go back to Mana um, and, and talk about Mana. Um, I know we, we, we're fast forwarding a bit, but let's just talk about Mana and then the build up to the, the big attack on the, on the Mana uh, National Park Fort. Okay, um, so I got stationed at Mana Pools in October 75, after having just done my national service. Um, they posted guys to Mana that had military experience because of the front where we were. And um, we also had uh, a contingent uh, of national servicemen. In those particular days, around about 75, 76, national parks would uh, recruit four national servicemen from Llewellyn Barracks, much like the, the RLI did and the SAS guys did and the officer training board. They would go to Lewen with each intake and choose four guys, normally volunteers. And and so we had a, a group of those guys there as well. And they took on more of a military role than a wildlife protection role. And we used to send them on patrols, um, sometimes accompanied by one of us officers and, and invariably too with some game scouts who knew the area where to find water and so on. And as I mentioned earlier, the big thing was uh, clearance patrols for landmines. We lived in a fort in those days, I forgot to mention. There was a fort that had been built with the help of the South Africans when the SAP were there. The SAP, as you may know, pulled out of uh, Rhodesia in about 75, beginning of 75, I think. And they had helped to build the fort there. And it was a very, very good fort with uh, turrets in each corner. Uh, very large walls filled with soil and so on. And we used to sleep there every night. The, the, the rangers, the African staff, the game scouts and the officers. So we would, um, eat and, and shower and that sort of stuff in daylight and then all get into the fort and get locked in, lock ourselves in at last light. And then first light, we would all go out and immediately check for APs or, or landmines. And then just talk about uh, picking up the fact that there was a chance of an attack and your preparation for the attack and, and yeah. the attack as it, uh, just tell us what you know about the big attack. Okay. We, um, we fell under the sort of jurisdiction auspices of, of the SP guys under Kariba. And we had a meeting with um, uh, Ben Pretorius, I think his name was then. He came and said that they had picked up in that there was a, a large crossing going to take place somewhere along the river. I mean, it was pretty open. So we extended our patrols uh, along the river a lot in those days. Um, anyway, on one of the clearance patrols, John Stevens was at that time my senior ranger. I was his range, his 2IC. Uh, while I was at Mana, I, I worked under three senior rangers there, Billy Howells, John Stevens, and Rob Murray. And um, so on one of our clearance patrols, uh, we came across this uh, cap, military cap, which had obviously been knocked off the head of one of the fellows creeping around at night. It was an East German rice fleck camo, which was worn almost extensively by Zipra. And that area, Mana Pools, was, fell under the Zipra area of operations. Zanda was much further to the, to the east, operating out of Mozambique. Um, and so we knew something was afoot. We looked around for tracks, and we couldn't find footprints. They were either very good at anti-tracking, or the recce that they had, we assumed that they had come to do, had taken place a couple of days before or a week before. Anyway, so we, we chatted to the National Service guys, the, the game scouts, and said, look, we've got to beef up our security here. 
and uh, we yeah, extended our patrols. Um, we were a little bit more aware that we might be attacked, and so we had little um, modus operandi what to do at night in case of attack, and we had ammo placed and so on. And I, I took the opportunity. I had done um, demolitions in the army, and I used that opportunity to put some welcoming presence for anybody that might come knocking on the door. And we managed to get a lot of stuff, um, landmines, um, pentalite, lots of pentalite, uh, cortex, explosive cord. And so we rigged up little welcoming presents and we, we made up our own frantan and hung them in the trees with wire. And it was pretty hodgepodge stuff, but we were all excited, waiting to be attacked. <laughs> And uh, it, w it eventually did happen, but I happened to have gone on time off. It was my turn for time off, and I had gone. And uh, when I was in Guelo with my parents, I heard the news that Monopoles had been attacked, and I wasn't there. Um, it was a bit of a faux pas on, on Zipra's part. Their recce wasn't so good. What they did was they actually attacked the junior staff accommodation. And I can understand the reason for that. So during the day, the African staff would be in the junior staff accommodation and they would be cooking their meals, had their own little fires and so on, and and rested there during the daylight hours. So when they moved back into the fort, a lot of the fires were still glowing. <laughs> and so when the zipper guys attacked, they thought that the junior staff houses where we lived because the fires were going, you know. So they attacked that and... The guys had a grandstand view of an attack on the junior staff accommodation and not not on the fort. The other interesting thing about that was that at that particular time, we had um, some army guys visiting that had come on a tracking course, and we were going to teach them tracking and bush skills. And John Stevens hadn't told us, but he had arranged – um, with the army guy in charge that they would do and they would fire into the air and pretend that we were being attacked. Then he would send some game scouts out in the morning and the guys would then track the game scouts as part of the tracking course. So when the attack took place, a real attack on the junior staff accommodation, the army guys who was camped in the warden's house thought it was part of the deal. So they thought, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is the start of our tracking course. <laughs> yeah, little did they know it was the real deal. Um, but unfortunately, I wasn't there. And uh, so the guys went and uh, tracked, and the guys went, the Zipper guys had gone back to the river. See, there were two attacks. Was that the first one? Yeah, that was the first one. That was around about 76. Um, and it was pretty wanked. Um, but I think they must have learned from that uh, because the next attack, which took place in 78, 79, I think, was the real deal. Um, I had long left uh, Mana then. As a matter of fact, I was transferred from Mana to Chisarera specifically to build a fort at Chisarera on the lines of the Mana Pools Fort because I had lived in the fort at Mana for nearly four years. And they said, you can go and build um, under Charlie Mackey. I was working under Charlie Mackey this. Anyway, yeah, so so Minor Pool's fort was attacked by a proper, well trained, well disciplined Zipra element. And you may recall that information that we received was that there was going to be a, a conventional type attacks taking place along the border. Mm -hmm. uh, Victoria Falls had been earmarked for such a thing and and this may very well have, whoops this may very well have been part of it let me just turn this nonsense off yeah um yeah so it how that attack started i've forgotten the dates but it, it's in that national parks book mm. in fact um i think i've got in 79 yeah it happened in 79 um the attack started during the day which was unusual um um about 5 30 6 o'clock in the evening where the guys um were 
showering and eating and what have you on the riverbank. If I can sort of draw a picture for you at Mana, uh, you've got the river obviously dividing Zimbabwe and Zambia, Rhodesia as it was then. The old warden's house was right on the bank. And next to that, we had a patio and a concrete table where we all took our meals, uh, breakfast, lunch, and supper, with a nice view of the river and so on. And a little bit further on, there was some those metal oil tents with a bit of thatch over it, with a veranda, built, pretty impromptu stuff. That's where the National Service guys used to spend the day. But at night, or at last night, we all withdrew to the fort. Okay. So... When the attack took place, it started off with um, 12 sevens, 12, 12,7 firing at the in the area of that concrete table. They must have assumed that the guys were still there um, in that area. So there were a lot of strikes in the trees around that patio and the warden's house. They also attacked the um, the National Service lean-to, the all tent. And if I recall, the roof was blown off, and we think that was a B-10 fired from the Zambian bank. At the time, uh, what later transpired was that, in fact, that there was a contingent of Zipra on an island very, very close to the house, but they were out of sight. And they may have initiated the small arms fire in the beginning. I, I find it quite interesting that they were brazen enough to attack in daylight, um, the start of it. Anyway. That then uh, got the guys hightailing into the fort. And if I recall, Doug, Doug Evans got caught with his pants down, literally showering, I think in the National Service area. He was maybe National Service then. And uh, had to run to the fort barefoot with a towel around his midriff, which must have been out of a sight if you know Doug. <laughs> anyway, he was the last guy into the fort. And, and he was the only guy that got injured believe it or not, he got a bit of shrapnel in the back of his neck um, from a mortar or a B-10 or something. Nothing much more than a, a prick, a pinprick. But the point was he was the first and only injury. So then the guys withdrew into the fort and, and then as it got dark, so that attack really intensified. And the guys reported there that it was a well-organized attack. They were being attacked from the west and from the the south. And um, there were commands given in English to these Zipra guys and whistles blown in the typical manner of their conventional uh, mm. fire and movement. Um, and they had an array of weapons, um, DPs, which were those big flat drum machine guns, um, it's got a very low cyclic rate, so you can hear a DP when it's firing. Um, RPDs, RPGs, B10, they really had an assortment. Mortars. Um, yeah, and mortars, yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, quite a quite an exciting thing to... And the battle went on all night. Our guys, that's right, that's right, went right on to, to dawn. And at dawn, uh, the Zipper guys pulled out. Or oh, just before dawn, it went quiet. And one wonders, did they run out of ammo or did they see that they were in a losing battle? I don't know. Our guys did exceptionally well. There weren't many guys there. There were, I think, uh, three permanent officers there and six game scouts. But coincidentally, um, Ollie Coltman was there, a senior uh, warden, a ranger at the time, senior ranger. He was there on VTU, the Voluntary Tracker Unit, which National Parks had formed to help out various uh, follow-ups and so on. He happened to be at Mana. And I think he was there because of the information received that there was going to be a, a, an attack. An attack was imminent. Uh, there was also the National Service guys, as I mentioned. And uh, two independent company from Kariba had some guys there as well, I think four or five guys. So the numbers were beefed up thank goodness, on that particular night. Um, but they, they held their own very, very well. You know, the likes of a senior guy like Ollie Coltman, uh, who's now deceased, he, were, he went from bunker to bunker reassuring the guys and controlling the, that fight when there was a concentration coming in from, 
from the west. He went there and made sure they had ammo and, and got the guys to not fire haphazardly and so on, specifically at targets, at, at muzzle flashes, for example, and so on. Yeah, they did very, very well. Wasn't one of the zipper guys shot in the tree? Um, yes. There was a guy, um, I, I thought it might have been on the fence, on our perimeter fence, but apparently he was up high um, directing fire, but he got himself sorted out. Um, and there's a sort of a rumor that he was pretty high on morphine because when they found his body the next day on the fence, yeah. he, he had a whole lot of morphine ampules with him, and he may have been the medic. Um, but someone suggested that he took a lot of rounds um, and he was very aggressive and kept coming. Um, but he, he eventually was killed on the fence, yeah. Steve, um, just talk us through some of your pals uh, from national parks who didn't make it. Um, I know there were quite a few. There's a, there's a role of honor. Um, black and white guys uh, killed in the line of duty. And I know you knew quite a few of those guys. Just just tell us about some, something about what happened. Yeah. I, I knew every one of them, actually. Um, I think we lost seven officers during the course of the war on active duty. And, um, yeah, I knew them all. I think the first guy to die I was Robin Robin Hughes. I hadn't met Robin Hughes. Um, he was the first, and he was one of the early members of 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 the Scouts uh, pseudo work. Um, he was a linguist, um, a naturalist, a great guy in the bush, knew his way around the bush and so on, and spent a lot of time in the valley and documenting uh, the Vadoma people uh, that lived. Um, in the mountains and so Tito, on. And the Tito people. He, yeah, so he was the first guy to really document a lot of it and about their their beliefs and their iron god and, and so on. Um, yeah, so he was the first. Uh, and then there was a couple more, Richard Smith, a very good friend, um, who was senior ranger at the time at uh, in Metopus. He was famous for doing leopard work. He devised a system of identifying leopard uh, territories by putting different colored glass beads into baits and then picking up the dung afterwards and looking to see the color of the beads. And, and he worked out their, their territories like yeah. that. It was fantastic work. Yeah. Long before radio tracking collars and... Interesting. camera traps and all that stuff. Steve, just tell us, um, Robin Hughes, he was killed on a follow, if I remember correctly. He was in the, it was really the tracker combat unit then, wasn't it? He was, he was involved that's, in the follow. That's correct. That's correct, yeah. He was one of the early guys. Um, he was working with Mike Bromwich. Um, Mike Bromwich, the guy that has compiled that fantastic book on national parks. Um, and those two guys, Robin and Mike, were the first guys ever to be involved in pseudo work, experimentally at the time. But they did amazing stuff. And 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 Robin was killed on on one of the follow ups there. Um, and Richard, yeah, Richard, Richard Smith was part of a, what we call the VTU. What happened was eventually uh, national parks created their own uh, tracking uh, unit called the VTU, Volunteer Tracking Unit. Um, because National Parks guys were used so frequently in follow-ups, they decided to make a, a unit and then organize it on a call-up basis so that um, teams of National Parks guys, normally two officers and two experienced game scouts, would go to the different operational areas mm -hmm. and operate out of the jocks there. Yeah. So, yeah, Richard was killed, sadly. Um, um, that springs to mind. Nick Gregory, another good friend. Um, cheapest. I've just gone blank. Um, Russell, Russell Williams, who was in the, in the unit with me. Very good tracker. Um, great Bushman. He was killed on a follow-up with Alistair Hull. Um, 
following uh, guys along the fire break near Wanky National Park between Det and Mchibi. Uh, there was some tracks picked up there, and so he was sadly killed there. Um, there's the late Kerry Finn. Kerry um, actually got a, a lateral transfer from National Parks into the Air Force. So I don't know if you want to include him in as a National Parks mm. person, but we certainly do. And and he was a chopper pilot in the Air Force and had a terrible accident where he deployed some guys. He was a G car pilot, deployed some guys, and then on takeoff flew into the bottom of the G of the K car. And both of them went down, and he was killed sadly. Yeah. Um, Jerry Bell, very very good friend of mine. Um, he he and I swapped places. I was at Mana, and he was at Marangora. And the provincial warden, I think, it was Paul Kutsi, arranged a, a swap. So I went up to Marangora, and Jerry came to Mana. We were very, very close friends. Uh, Graham Wiltshire was also at mine at the time. Um, we were known as the Three Musketeers. We were always in trouble on our time off. And yeah, Jerry um, had come out to see me on on one of the trips where they do resupply and pick up mail and what have you out of mine. And uh, the staff, um, the Game Scouts, were had all come out on one of the one of the lorries from Mana Pools. And had gone into Karoi and done their shopping, and they were on their way back. And Jerry popped in to have tea with me before going down to Mana. I think I was the last person to see him alive, last um, officer. And I remember distinctly saying to Jerry when he left me, put your chest webbing on, which would have covered his chest, because he later on took a round through, through the chest on, on his left side, which killed him, sadly. Um, so what happened was on the way down to Mana, the truck was ahead of him and they went into an ambush on what we call the, the Golden Highway. It's a beautiful long stretch of sandy road, goes down to Mana, goes through the Jess. If you know Mana well, it's where you often see Nyala crossing and mm -hmm. Crested Unifal and whatever. It's a beautiful place and they got ambushed. We don't know how that ambush took place, but I do know that the truck went off onto the side of the of the camber, and we lost three guys there: uh, Michael Mafiros and uh, Zovovo and Joram. I even remember their names. They were good guys of ours at Mana. And Jerry came along a couple of minutes afterwards and thought they might have broken down or something. And he was with a, a good sergeant called Kenny. Kenny was later decorated for bravery. Incredible guy, sergeant, uh, senior scout. And as they approached, they were in the killing ground, and they took a shot. And Jerry got a shot in in, in his chest and drove through, but died and went off the road. Mm -hmm. Sergeant Kenny took two hits: one in his ankle, in his left ankle, and another shot hit him, hit his rifle on the gas ports, on the gas works of his FN which made his rifle not cycle, so it wouldn't work on, you know, semi-automatic. So when he realized that Jerry was dead, he jumped out the vehicle, which had come to a halt, and he was right there in the killing fields, and they were firing at him. He would return fire by cocking each round. Very commendable. And then during this firefight, a herd of elephant got spooked in the jest and were trumpeting and screaming and they ran across the road and Kenny used that opportunity and ran into the elephant and and literally ran with the elephant and the gooks they they didn't follow on after that because of the elephant and left him he then imagine running with a shot through your ankle <laughs> he then ran all the way to mana and got to mana just before dawn and woke graham wiltshire up my other very good friend uh, who's now deceased as well and um and uh, jerry was still in his slippers can you believe it you know those stoky things graham was. graham was i beg your pardon graham and he he got into the vehicle which was one of those funny little but wasn't a pookie but it was a thing 
I think we called it a leopard. Um, a VW engine on the back, and it really looked like a funny thing. He, he came in that, checked that Jerry was dead, and then came up to me at Marangora and told me that Jerry had been killed and the Game Scouts, there were some Game Scouts dead. He didn't know how many. He didn't go into the vehicle. And uh, so we contacted the police. Uh, the police got hold of the army who were stationed at Makuti, and then a follow-up was organized. And um, that army vehicle that went down the next morning early actually hit a landmine at the site. So the Zipra guys had laid a landmine um, there. No one was injured in that. It was a proper mine-proof vehicle. Yeah, so Graham and I and these guys did the follow-up, and we followed the, the group of Zipra all the way down to the Zambezi to DOE camp where they crossed back into Zambia. But, yeah, that was Jerry. Steve, um, a while ago I, had, I chatted to uh, Taffy Matnodze, who was a, who, who was a Zipra, fighter um, and he was telling us about some of his encounters um, one of them as you know uh, took place near Bumi Hills on, on, on Lake Kariba and Taffy talked us through his recollections uh, I'm interested to hear your side of the story but how you saw it from your perspective yeah, I, I, I must say I was uh, taken aback when I watched your interview on Tabby. I had not met him. I'd heard of him, but I'd not met him. I'd heard about him through the likes of Pete Clements and and so on. And and Tabby mentions Pete Clements. They're, they're, they're still very good friends. And uh, Pat Mavros, uh, he mentioned his name and so on. And the irony is this that Pat Mavros, Pete Clements, myself, a bloke called Bruce Bartlett, and so on, we were on an advanced tracking course at Ruby Hills when Taffy's incursion took place. And we were suddenly made operational and go to organize a follow-up, pick up tracks and so on. And I remember distinctly finding a, a food cache. Taffy doesn't mention the food cache. He talks about an arms cache. But we found one of his food caches on um, um, on a, the peninsula known as Photo Corner. And I tell you what, everything came to a grinding halt while we helped ourselves to <laughs> New Zealand pears and tin cream, and we had a gutter of note. It was it was fantastic. Uh, it was Ian Ritchie, Ian Ritchie as well. Quite a few of the guys. Anyway, it was fantastic. But then on the serious note. Um, he he had us running around, I tell you what. He was a professional, uh, Taffy. He knew his stuff. Anti-tracking, he was good. And um, we, he ran circles around us for a while. But then he made a mistake of going back, trying to get back to Zambia. And we blocked him in on Photo Corner. It's a huge sort of Italian bootleg-shaped piece of land, peninsula. And the idea was just literally block off. Unless he was going to swim with the hippos and the crocodiles, we would get him. The interesting thing was your interview with him gave me cold shivers because he talked about the op. And I was involved in it right there. And one thing that I cannot get through my head is that he got through the lines where we had physically blocked it off. And he states in his talk to you, that one of the soldiers lit a cigarette and he knew where we were and he got through because of that. I don't know what idiot lit a cigarette, but he couldn't have been one of us. <laughs> I, I can't believe that. Anyway, um, so yeah, and the rest is history. He went on then to wreak havoc uh, further inland as far as Gokwe and everywhere. I think it's even as far as uh, Gatuma. Yeah. Yeah. He certainly got around. Uh, I want to meet him now. I really do want to meet him. And uh, through Pete Clements, I, I think I'll do that. Uh, you get on, we'll organize it. We'll get on like a bloody house on fire. I, I love the guy. He's He's got a great sense of humor. And um, Jesus, he's got, a, he's got a lot of stories. 
Yeah. I, I'll just quickly tell you something about meeting guys after the war. Um, I was stationed at Matetsi as a senior ranger. And um, Matetsi headquarters is like runs all of the safari operators, the hunting, national parks hunting areas. But I did a lot of anti-poaching work in those days. And we captured a guy who had had a little camp in a ravine. And it reminded me so much of the war days. This guy's hut was camouflaged, he anti-tracked but we, we bumped into this camp. Anyway, we captured him. So I was interrogating him. And he turned around and he said to me, I know you. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean you know me? He said, I know you. You used to live at Robin's camp. I said, yeah. And you drove a white Land Rover. He said, I watched you going shopping and back, but we decided not to take you. We wanted the police from Panamatenga. They wanted to nail the police. And they let, and he says, we watched you go and come and left you. <laughs> so he's <laughs> quite he was, a story. He was a zipper guard. In, yes. But uh, they wanted to take the police out more than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget that, jeepers. Anyway, we we bumped him for poaching, and and that was that. Steve, did you um, were you involved in any of those big operations towards the end around the falls where Zipra were coming across in quite big numbers? I was not. No, I was not. Um, I'm trying to work out where I was then. You're talking about about seventy nine, hey? Yeah. Big crossings. Yeah. yeah. No. Um, where was I then? Can't even remember where I was stationed. Metopus, I think. Yeah, I was in the Metopus. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, I was not involved in those, but they were serious. They were also those big Zippo incursions I was talking about. The same thing that happened at Mana. Mm. They were endeavoring to do the same sort of thing there. They wanted to take out the airport um, and and surround or take over Victoria Falls town. You know, it was a big big tourist town with a lot of money coming in. Would have been a hell of a blow if they had done so. Steve, I know you spent a lot of time in that um, wonderful wilderness area, Chisarira up in the northwest of the country. And um, you spent a lot of time with Charles Mackey, um, who's another one of the doyens of the department, I would say. Um, and I know that Charlie got hurt at some stage, but interested to know the circumstances and what actually happened there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Charlie and I and Blood Nut Curtis were stationed at uh, Chisarera together uh, when we built up the fort and everything. Um, and we became quite good friends. But one uh, one incident that comes to mind where Charlie got badly injured. Um, I was actually on R&R &R, uh, from the army um, and I had gone to main camp. And um, Charlie was on a patrol, um, a vehicle patrol, two vehicles, two Land Rovers. They had been sent in specifically to assess um, water holes to see if any zipper guys had been using the water holes in transit uh, through the park. Um, that's what he was mandated to do. He had Tom Finn with him, and they had two vehicles. Um, I know that one of the game scouts who I'd worked with was a guy called Makeko. Brilliant, brilliant guy. He said he passed away since. Anyway, they were patrolling, checking out the pans, and they came across some uh, Zipra tracks at the, a pan called Mitsuri, Mitsuri Pan, which is sort of central west of the park, way off the, the beaten track, way off the tourist track. And uh, they had decided to, to travel east towards Tendere and Vernies, Vernies, where there is now a safari camp, as a matter of fact. So off they went to Vernie's, and by the way, Vernie's pan is named after a very early ranger within the department that was killed in the Second World War. Um, he was a ranger, yeah. Anyway, 
they were heading towards Verdi's and they picked up tracks again. Um, and they slowed down or stopped to, to assess the tracks to get out. And at that precise moment, um, they were ambushed. So the tracks that they had seen were as a group of uh, Zipra guys walking down the road. They heard the vehicles coming. They went up, up onto the right into the, into the woodland and, um, and then opened up on the first vehicle, which was Charlie and Tom. Um, the Zipra guys initiated the ambush with a, um, a rifle fired, um, rifle grenade. Uh, the Russian kind, I think we called it an M60 or something. It, uh, designed to, on impact, spread a whole lot of shrapnel. I think, um, in Mike Bromwich's book, they mistakenly said it was an anti-tank, uh, rifle grenade. And I believe that had it been so, it would have killed both of the occupants of the vehicle. But it was an anti-personal one that, and it hit the cross member of the, of the windscreen on the right hand side of the driver and the driver was was Charlie at the time and and it exploded obviously it shattered the windscreen and a lot of the shrapnel went down into the door um, and some shrapnel entered Charlie's uh, stomach and on his legs and one piece of shrapnel went into his eye right eye if I remember correctly um, so that was a catastrophe. Then they opened up with small arms and, um, Tom, uh, Tom Finn was, um, knocked unconscious by the blast. He, he recalls waking up, having fallen down into the, the, the well area of the Land Rover. And he woke up in a hell of a dwell in a daze and fell out the vehicle onto the ground. So he was on the right, the proper side of the ambush to be safe. Whereas Charles was in the, taking the brunt of it. How he never got hit more times is a miracle, absolute miracle. So he, he fell out the vehicle and down next to the wheel and then eventually made his way. He recalls um, being in not so much pain, but physically difficult to move. And I'm not surprised because he, he had been peppered in his gut and he had taken a round through his gut, which I believe went in the gut and came out the side here. Quite a miracle that he managed to get out. And anyway, the game scouts, Makeko included, all returned fire and, and they eventually went behind a very large Mitsuri tree, you know, Mitsuri, Combritum in Burby, um, which is a very, very strong wood. And I think they were very lucky that that tree was right there. So they managed to hide behind that. And the Game Scouts, some of them only had 303s, I think. It was bloody ridiculous. Um, and they returned fire. And, uh, and Make, no, not Makeko, Edward, Edward Molillo, who was Charlie's right hand man, Game Scout. Edward was one of the trackers of Charlie's unit when he did VTU tracking. So his brave guy, he ran back to the vehicle and collected Charlie's weapon, which had been left behind, and picked up the radio. Now, this is an interesting part. This is where I come in. So I had been just visiting mates at main camp, and it was a Sunday. I recall it being a Sunday. And I walked down from the Waterbucks head where all the guys were having a drink. I walked down to the main camp office to make a phone call. In those days, the telephones were those sort of cranking phones. And we had an operator in, in the, in the sort of an ops room where the telephone were and the radios were. And, um, I went to go and book a call to my then girlfriend who was a teacher down in Bulawayo. And I was sitting around waiting for the call to come through because he had to ring debt, who then placed the call and then the exchange of debt would then put it through, you know. And I remember main camp's number was 64. They used to shout, debt 64, you know. <laughs> that was main camp. Anyway, so I'm sitting there and the, 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 the HF radio had been turned down 
obviously the telephone operator didn't like this thing blurring in his ear while he was operating. So he turned the volume down. But I happened to be sitting right there and I heard Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. And I thought, what? And I cranked up the radio, but it was very, very difficult to hear. And it was Tom on an old TR-28, which we had been issued. I think they all ex-police things. Not the 48s that we used in the army where we could tune in to Zambian patrols and, and cuss them. Um, but the TR-28, which had set frequencies. And he was calling Mayday, Mayday. So I answered them. And um, then I went up to the provincial warden's office, regional warden then, uh, Boyd Reese, and told him what was going on. And he had a radio at his house, which uh, we tuned in, and it was much stronger. We could hear exactly what was going on. They had been ambushed. So Boyd Reese then got hold of uh, um, the jock at Wangi, and and organized um, a helicopter. Now, Alistair Hull was there as well. He was in, at the tourist office because he was chatting his now wife, uh, Di, Di Thompson. And and he had also been in the army with me. And uh, if I remember correctly, he might have flown with the helicopter. The helicopter came to main camp to pick up someone to take them to the site because the guys on the ground didn't have any of those homing devices to home in a helicopter to, you know, the short, uh, small beans. <laughs> so they had to pick up someone to take them there. And I think Alistair took the helicopter to the scene and they casavacked, uh, um Charlie out of there. Um, I think Tom applied a little bit of um, first aid. They had a medical kit. Once again, Edward Melillo ran back to the vehicle to get the medic kit under fire. It was amazing, actually, to think that those guys like Edward and Mark Keiko, none of them had been trained in the army. You know, they had picked up stuff from us. They were bloody good bushmen. They were bloody good trackers. But to show that kind of bravery under fire, we don't know how many Zipra there were, but uh, it was estimated six or eight of them. So a heap of fire coming down. Anyway, um, and so Charlie was then, I think, Kazavak back to main camp where a fixed wing flew him to hospital. Yeah, I think that's how it worked out. But it was fortuitous that I was there at the time wanting to speak to my then girlfriend and hearing this faint mayday, mayday. Unbelievable. Yeah. Anyway, the rest is history. Poor old Charles now rest in peace. He's deceased, died of cancer. But as you said correctly, one of the doyans. Good, good man. Mm. Good boss. Good research officer. He was a pilot. He used to fly with that one eye. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, great guy. <laughs> uh, just uh, Steve, tell us quickly about Rich Elwood, um, how he lost his leg, and he was also he also flew with 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 one leg, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, that's right. He had a a pig leg. What happened? Richard was down at Minor Pools, and uh, in those days we had these. Um, Mineproofed Land Rovers, which I think we called Rhinos. Um, they were on a Land Rover chassis with a, a steel plated side with roll bars and then a back door, which was a steel plate. And the petrol tank and everything was built outside that. I, I, I do believe that I know Richard was standing on the back. He shouldn't have been. He should have been inside with the door closed. But it may be because he was the gentleman that he was, he offered his seat to someone else and was standing outside. They had a, uh, a landmine detonation and it, it, he had to have his leg amputated, yeah. Still to this day, what yeah. was around with him. But a great pilot and a great guy. Great guy. We had uh, quite a few incidents like that at Mana. Um, Mike Jones, who later on became uh, an ecologist, was a ranger at Mana, and Dave Winnell was a ranger there. And they were on a patrol, and they went to check an old disused camp that we had called Vundu Camp. It's been since resurrected and used by an operator now, but there were a couple little uh, huts there, and they went to check it, and the uh, Zipra guys had put some anti-personnel mines at the step. So Mike hit that and lost his leg. 
And you may recall I, I, I mentioned Kenny, Sergeant Kenny, earlier. Kenny was uh, awarded a uh, bravery award. Um, he's the guy that was with Jerry Bell when Jerry was killed. Well, he was also with Mike Jones and Dave Winnell and just ran in and grabbed them and pulled them out. He didn't care about his own safety because there could have been more anti-personal minds there. And he pulled Mike Jones under a tree and away from the scene. Dave Winnell got peppered, uh, but he could walk or run, as the case may be. But uh, <laughs> poor old uh, Mike, yeah, he lost his leg. Yeah. Roger that lost a leg, but that wasn't anything to do with the war. Yeah. Steve, I'd love to talk to you more about um, your anti poaching endeavors after the war ended, but maybe we can do that at another stage. Um, I do want to carry on talking to guys about wildlife and hunting and related stories. So maybe we can do that at another stage. But, but yeah, I'd like to. Um, Appreciate your time today, and uh, thanks for the memories. Oh, thank you. Thanks for thinking about the National Parks, guys. Mm -hmm.